So one of my, uh, the, the title of this is The Fields of Fire, Conflicts Around the World. You know, one of my most treasured I, possessions, you have to speak possessions when I was growing up here in Bangalore, uh, haunting the one and only bookshop in Church Street, Premier Bookshop, was a book of World War I poetry. My favorite poem was In Flanders Field. I don't know if any of you uh, recall it. It says, in Flanders Field, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. We are the dead, shot days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. You know, given the uh, conflicts around the world that we, uh, that we have all uh, witnessed, especially uh, the one that is happening in uh, Israel and, and Palestine and Gaza, you know, the wars in the 21st century are being fought in a completely different manner. There's no fighting in the trenches. I mean, there are no cannons, no bayonets, no, it's all missiles and bombs and total annihilation. Just like the images from World War I stay with you, so do the images of the brutality of our times, you know, the butchery unleashed on Afghan women. Uh, and, uh, you know, young people in Afghanistan who, young women in Afghanistan who are stoned to death, as you people who've covered Afghanistan know. And the Lankan Tamils, that stayed with me for a long time. The, uh, the ordinary Tamils being used as human shields by the Tamil Tigers in May 2009, uh, you know, and now Hamas and Israel. Uh, where Hamas's unspeakable atrocities as they attack the unsuspecting Israelis on October 7th has been replicated a uh, hundred times over by the decimation of the Palestinians and Gaza itself. And of course, there's Ukraine. So on the panel today, let me do a quick introduction, is Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed, who served twice in Saudi Arabia, in the United Arab Emirates and Yemen. Uh, he's played a role in getting our Indian hostages released during the Second Gulf War, which very few people know about. And he's written this very prescient book on uh, West Asia at War, which is, uh, I think, a book for all students on West Asia. We also have Ambassador Navtej Sarna, who served in Tel Aviv and Washington, and who has a stable of titles to his name, including Indians at Herod's Gate. And... And my friend Nitin Pai, director at the Takshashila Institution here in Bangalore, regular columnist on world affairs who describes himself as a policy wonk. <laughs> so let's start with you, Ambassador Ahmed. The war that has captured all our attention, uh, the Hamas-Israel conflict, which saw a ceasefire, a swapping of hostages for, for prisoners held in Israeli jails, uh, there's no extension of the ceasefire, it's gone back to... But what is the role? I, I was most intrigued by Doha. Would you explain to the audience what is it that makes Doha play such a huge role? I mean, I know they did a, play a huge role in the Taliban and uh, it, with helping American, uh, America exit Afghanistan, but this is a completely different game and has it happened before? Have they played such a role before? Qatar is one of the smallest countries as far as West Asia is concerned, but it has played a larger role in regional affairs for over 20 years. Initially, it played the role that the Americans wanted it to play, but were reluctant to do anything themselves. So Qatar was the proponent of the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam in general. After 9-11, the Americans thought that the region needed to be reformed and that this reform should include the Muslim Brotherhood as being the principal role player in the politics of the region. And this got strengthened further after the Arab Spring uprisings. Qatar during this period has built up very substantial ties with Hamas and in Gaza. Behind the scenes it has been engaged with various ceasefire proposals in the past, various reconstruction activity after the Israeli depredations. So this is not a new role. It is possibly the only major country in the region that has close ties with Hamas. Therefore, not surprising, at this stage, people should turn to Qatar and seek a substantial role for them in promoting 
a sort of ceasefire, truce, swap of hostages, and ultimately, possibly, a peace process. But Mr. Ahmed, isn't it also true that the uh, they they are the people who are uh, sheltering the Hamas leaders like Yahya Shanwar and uh, Ismail Haniya and so on and so forth in Doha itself? Uh, I mean, did that come about because uh, Doha initiated it or Hamas sought that? Or was this really Iran playing let, a big game? Let us be very clear about certain facts of life in the region. Israel has a license to kill. James Bond could kill one person at a time. The Israelis have the license to kill several hundred people at the same time. They do targeted killings wherever they can and wherever they need to in their version. They have killed a very large number of Hamas leaders, most, uh, most dramatically even in Dubai some years ago. So yes, certain Hamas leaders have taken sanctuary in Qatar at present because of targeted killing. This conflict that you see ongoing today is a strategic defeat for Israel. It has shown up the gross inadequacy of their armed forces and the failure of their intelligence and the failure of their political leadership. It is in this background that the Israelis have now undertaken this massive killing of the Palestinian people. I had predicted that they would go for a kill rate of 1 is to 10. It has now become 1 is to 12. But, but they not. still need to kill Hamas leaders. Isn't it also, hasn't it also blown up in Hamas's face? Not at because, all. Because they have set off with October 7, the kind of uh, decimation, destruction of Gaza is unprecedented. Please remember that the Palestinians are living in, under occupation. And occupation people have a right to resistance under international law. This is a right exercise consistently over the last hundred years, including in our own country. We have forgotten these lines that we used to sing with such enthusiasm, Sar Faroshi ki tamanna aaj hamare dil mein hai. Dekhna hai katil, dekhna hai katil, baazu hai katil ka kya hai? Yeah. Zor kitna baazu hai katil mein hai. Resistance always will face the bullets of the occupation force. Always. I reminded, I would remind you that this attack at Jallianwala Bagh was the British giving a lesson to the people of Punjab who had taken up various acts of resistance in that state about which my colleague has written so eloquently. Please recall that you live in resistance but you will always suffer extraordinary violence from the occupation force. But that resistance has not gone away. Despite all the assaults of the, uh, of the Israelis. And it has, even Gaza itself, in the last few years, this is the fifth attack. The last major attack was in 2014. 2,000 Palestinians were killed, 66 Israeli soldiers were killed. 2,000 Palestinians, 500 of them children. Israel enjoys this extraordinary impunity that no other country in the world has. So yes, the Palestinians throw rocks and they take bullets in their chest, but they have not given up from 1948 and they are not going to give up in this century until their aspirations have been fulfilled. But this, this is the second Nakba. They're describing it as a second Nakba, which is another exodus and another killing of, you know, thousands and thousands of Palestinians, right? So where do you see it leading? Because the ceasefire has ended. There is the not going to be a second Nakba. This is what the Israelis desperately want. Their messianic vision is that the good Lord in his wisdom has given the chosen people the right to exclusive use and control and resistance and, resist, and residence in this territory which is called the state of Israel. No other people are allowed to live there except as slaves. This is, they believe that it is a right given to them in the Old Testament. Therefore, as I have said only half jokingly, they see the good Lord as a landlord and they have, and they see the Old Testament as a lease agreement exclusively with the Jewish people. 
so long as you have this mindset and this vision you will have continued violence because while the jews went into diaspora sent there by the roman people and the roman generals the palestinian people lived in the same land for 2000 years and suddenly after the european holocaust against the jewish people they are transported to the holy land and are told that there are no people there pretend that they are blind deaf and dumb and they can't see those people in front of their eyes that was the nakba now the israelis want a second nakba they nakba means catastrophe they want the people of the west bank to go into jordan and the people of gaza to go into egypt so that the jews can enjoy this territory exclusively as their birth right So this, this is not acceptable to the Palestinian people. So, Mr. Ahmed, there is a, a very prominent Palestinian journalist called writer called Gada Karim, who writes extensively and has written this book saying one state. Her solution is a one state solution, which is, goes against even the 1973 accords, any of the accords that were uh, reached by the uh, you know uh, by Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak or any of those people. what is is the is the way forward i mean are we going to see an exodus of the palestinians into the sinai peninsula which is what apparently the the game is and as you have written also about the israelis have had this idea from the 70s that gazans should be sent off to the sinai and the west bank people uh, who live there 3.7 million palestinians live in the west bank 2.3 million Palestinians live in Gaza. There you have 200 or 300 thousand Palestinians living in the East Jerusalem, and you have about 2 million Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. These people taken together are more than the Jewish population in that region. And yet they're not able to fight back. Sorry. So this is what they are in. So therefore, they have to live. in circumstances of servitude now the one state solution requires the israeli people to take a fresh look at their messianic vision this idea that you can have exclusive control over this space of land divinely endowed to one people the chosen people that will need to be reviewed i have seen no evidence of that for the time being even this new arab peace plan that they're talking about which egypt and jordan and See, the arab peace plan suffers from the same handicap you have to that requires palestinians and is and israelis living side by side in the same territory i just pointed out that israel does not accept a non jewish community living in the holy land on the basis of equality so until you have a change in the israeli approach you cannot think of a two state solution or the so called one state solution i agree ambassador sarma if i could come to you uh, you know that's it's very interesting that washington has put itself out to such a great extent on this backroom kind of peace deal with uh, doha uh, you know which reaching out to the uh, you know hamas and so on uh especially because you know i mean all this talk about uh, basically biden president us Bi the us president biden uh, you know looking more at his chances of reelection uh, through the jewish lobby rather than uh, really being moved by the plight of the israelis or the palestinians do you i mean you served in israel and the us what is it that actually goes on between these two uh capitals <laughs> Thank you, Nina, and uh, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed is always a difficult act to follow. Uh, but you know, this is a very complicated uh, story. It's a very complicated region, and the relationship that you talk about, the U.S.-Israel relationship, is itself very complicated. I don't think we have the time to go into all its aspects, but very briefly. from the starting from the present situation uh and going back the united states has a very special relationship with israel let's take that as one more fact of life uh it's not just uh, you know winning elections through the jewish lobby 
because the Jewish lobby also is not monolithic in the United States. There are several shades of Jewish opinion. Some of them are more in line with the Zionist attitude and the right-wing attitude that we have seen in Israel recently. When I say recently, the last two decades. And some are more, uh, you know, are actually more, take a slightly different position on the Palestinian issue. But the fact is the U.S. sees Israel and support to Israel as a bulwark for protection of its own interests in the Middle East, as a bulwark against the and adversarial forces like Iran. Uh, and as a protector of its interests, whether it's oil, whether it's gas, whether it's uh, strategic presence, whether it's economic investment. And so it's a very special relationship. They call about the two democracies. There's a huge amount of subsidy to the tune of $3 billion a year, which is budgetary support uh, to, to Israel. And arms supplies. Sorry? And arms supplies. That, of course, as we have seen uh, in the present case. So it's a very close strategic relationship, which goes, which, of course, the Jewish lobby is an important factor, but not the only factor. Now, in the present situation, I think the United States, after the October 7 attacks by Hamas, uh, went in full force behind Israel. And President Biden's visit, of course, I mean, the, the best light you can have on it is that he went there to delay the ground invasion of Gaza, which could have been possible. But overall, the U.S. gave full support to the Israeli right of self-defense, as did the U.K. and as did Germany and many other countries of Europe. Now, why that is, is a separate issue. However, because of what has happened in Gaza, there is a pressure building up on the U US. There is an in change of internal opinion. There is a huge amount of dissent within the administration, in the academia, and the universities. Similarly, in Europe, this, there is the support for complete you know, Israeli right of self-defense, quote-unquote, is also wavering. France, for instance, yeah. has been more forthright. So these, these countries, the basic interest of the United States now is that they don't want to get painted more and more into a corner. They would like this to end very quickly, for Israel to declare victory as quickly as possible on Hamas, uh, in whatever, you know, the victory narrative has not yet been fashioned out, but there will have to be a victory narrative. Secondly, a quick return of the hostages so that they can say that, yes, we have managed. There is some justification of the destruction of Gaza, that we did it to get the hostages back and we killed so many Hamas, etc. But that and seems the third, very unrealistic at the no, moment. No, I'll come to that. And the third aspect is that they would, they are saying now, please be careful of the civilian casualties, yeah. the numbers, because that is what is giving rise to the counter-opinion. So it's a narrow maneuvering space at the moment. And yes, you said unrealistic objectives of Israel. Yes, it is a very unrealistic objective and it is not going to be attainable. But the simple point is that here, and you know, I've, Yes, there is a certain amount of resistance, there is occupation. But we must remember that there, was, there has been a lot of opportunity for Israel and Palestine to actually bring about the two-state solution. No, but is the U.S. Is the US being outplayed and no. outmaneuvered by, by uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem? Because well, I, 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 I think the, the, this uh, tale does wag the dog. You know, yeah. uh, Bibi Netanyahu, uh, Biden is in great danger of being captive to Netanyahu's drama. And so he, you know, there, there is a, he, he doesn't have the full freedom. 
because there are a lot of factors, including electoral ones, playing. Yeah, Otherwise, they could actually cut, cut in, off support in fact, immediately. Ambassador, if we could just explain to the audience about the, uh, the rise of the right wing. They seem to be calling the shots. There is, is the, Iraq, uh, uh, the Israeli defense minister, Yov Galant, who seems to be the one who, uh, Look, you know. Yeah, Galant is the defense minister. Uh, there is also the ho national home... Uh, uh, home Minister or the National Security Minister called Itamar Ben Gvir. There is the Finance Minister Smotrik. Uh, the point is that Bibi Netanyahu has been in power now for the second time in his second avatar for the last 15 years. And in these 15 years, he has, uh, you know, cats have nine lives, he has several more. He has managed. So, you know, there, there have been about five elections in Israel in the last two to three years. And every time, because he is under major criminal charges, he will go to prison. Yeah. Uh, if, you know, if he's out of power and the... So everything has been tried. There's been major judicial reform, which has seen, or attempted judicial reform, which has seen huge protests in Israel itself. Because Israeli opinion is also not a monolith. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. So within and second, Israel... So in, in a bid to stay in power, he has found coalition partners really on the extreme right fringe. And they are running the agenda. A lot of provocations in the last one year came because of their policies. And there has been provocation on the Al at the Al-Aqsa mm. Mosque. There have been the increased Ramadan. attacks... Um, uh, settler activity, very provocative settler activity in the West Bank. There have been statements which are inflammatory from the right wing and Netanyahu has played along because he needs that support. Now, no, but what explains the rise of the right wing is what I want to know. What is it that actually brought them? Because the settlers have been, uh, there are 700,000 settlers now in, in uh, the West Bank. And apparently in, uh, they want to uh, take back Gaza. And, uh, you know, well, the settl set settler activity has been one major provocation uh, for the last several years. And... Neither the Israeli government, any Israeli government, there have been nuances in different Israeli governments, but no Israeli government has really cracked down on the settlers. And this has been one reason for the failure of the Oslo process. The Americans, except for President Obama, who made very strong uh, statements, but then also sort of petered out on settler activity, the Americans have not done it. Because, again, as Ambassador Ahmed mentioned, there is this messianic uh, attachment to the land, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. It's not just the Jews, I must say. There is a very strong Christian Zionist lobby, oh. which, which includes people like vice, the former Vice President Pence, uh, and included the famous Lord Balfour, who made the Lord Balfour uh, the Balfour Declaration. The Christian Zionist lobby has this peculiar zeal that if the land of Israel stays in the hands of the Hebrews, then the Messiah will come again. So when you served in Israel, did you see any dissenting opinion? Because I hear with the pe a lot of young people of that I met in Israel... Of course there is dissenting opinion. There is dissenting opinion. Israel is a very fractious democracy. Uh, if you read the Jerusalem Post and you read the Haaretz on the same day, you will think you're uh, reading about two different countries. countries. Uh, so there are very, uh, very different views. But as a political constituency... The left in Israel or the peace camp in Israel is more or less dead. It has petered out. You know, the famous, the Labour the Labor Party, which to some extent, you know, had a more accommodative approach towards the Palestinians, has only four seats in the present Knesset. You know, the, uh, the, the other, the Meretz, has, has, has zero. You know, so... There has been a rise of the right wing. There has been a right uh, rise and, and a slow petering off of the old, uh, you know, the, the labor camp, the labor party and that kind of thinking. Because there has been a rise. And unfortunately, I must say, 
that the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinians post Oslo have also not done much to help themselves and nor frankly have the other Arab countries. I was going to the other that. Arab countries do make a lot of noise but you know they are they were they were they were all standing up in queue to do a deal with Israel and three or four of them have done it and the Saudis were on the verge of doing it whether they would have done it or not is is an open question yeah, if i can if i can yeah. ask uh, nitin pai that question don't you think that the abraham accords and uh, the the saudi deal that was going to be signed with israel i mean that is the uh, the common conclusion that has been uh, that it's been come to by everyone that this is why hamas did this to you know to end that once and for all so there would be no deal with all the arab nations without uh, the palestinians yeah, Nina, thanks. You know, that's the first, and let me just take that up, right? Because there are three horrible uh, assessments that I see from the perspective of an Indian. What are India's interests in this, right? There is a Palestinian cause in the story. There's an Israeli cause in the story. I'm more interested in the Indian cause and the Indian interest in this. So what is it that worries me as an Indian nationalist? First... I think Hamas has shown that terrorism can work. You said, you know, these guys were all lining up to do a deal with Israel. Abraham Accords sold the Palestinians down the river. You know, we ignored them. And boom, you know, 7th of October, and everybody's talking about this two-state solution, including President Biden, right? So there is a fresh impetus to the Palestinian cause brought about by an act of terrorism. And whichever side of the fence you're worried, you sit on, you should be worried about this. Because after 9-11, after, after 26-11, I think there was a global consensus that terrorism does not work. You know, there is a global consensus against terrorism. You could do all these things, but no one's going to, you know, your political rewards are not going to be there. And now you have it. And a lot of people are responsible for this, including the governments of Israel and the, uh, and the Arab countries. Second, You've accepted that collective punishment is acceptable. You know, I thought the idea of collective punishment of a civilian population was against international law. And all of us believed it for a long period of time. But now you've got the hammering of Gaza. I think the numbers were pointed out. Uh, and I study counterinsurgency. I study military strategy. And from what little I know, I think there was a possibility for Israel to punish Hamas without having to wreak the kind of destruction and the collective punishment of the people in Gaza. Yet they did it, and yet it was accepted, and no questions asked. That's and that's terrible for a lot, because there are a lot of people around the world who want to do collective punishment. And from collective punishment to mass atrocities to greater atrocities is just a slippery slope. That's the second thing which concerns me. The third thing which concerns me is that now nobody has even a fig leaf to talk about international law or international norms. Because as the Prime Minister of Malaysia pointed out, you know, you go to, the Americans come to us and ask us to support Ukraine because they are being hammered by the Russians. And now they also ask us to support Israel because they are hammering the Palestinians. So who, who if you're the West, nominally speaking for international law and an international liberal order, you seem to have one story on Ukraine and you have another story on, on, uh, on Gaza and, and Israel. And the rest of the world sort of sees this, right? And the rest of the world sees it and says, look, why should we now think that the Americans and the West and the liberal side of uh, the world are any better than the Chinese and the Russians? Because each side seems to be just taking the position that is in their interest. On the Russians and the Chinese, Nathan, do you think that the, uh, this could actually work to you know, promote them as well, to pr push them up as a, well, a I, greater I, power, particularly China? And I'd, I'd no, like I, I, I don't think so. Nakesh. I don't think so. It doesn't, because if you look at it, Chinese, the Chinese power has been seen as irrelevant in this. Uh, they, they're making a lot of rhetorical noises, trying to uh, tell they did the world host that. the Arab League. Yeah, they're saying, we are not the United States, we are China, you know, come to us, we'll stand. Rhetorically, they're there. But, Materially, they are absent. They, can, they can't change anything which is going on in, uh, in West Asia. Uh, so are the Russians. They are, you know, the Russians might be supporting the Iranians and the Iranians might be supporting uh, you know, the Hamas and other things. But directly, they don't have a play. The most influential actor is still the United States. And the United States has been seen as a very partisan, very 
a hypocritical actor mm. which does not seem to be standing up for the values that it was talking about on the 6th of October. That's true. And that is dangerous for us. It's not about hypocrisy. I mean, everybody is a hypocrite, hypocrite in international relations. But it's very bad for us because in every kind of a conflict or an international relations situation India faces, we might be up against actors who will now operate in this, you know, world where terrorism works, where you can do collective punishment and you could, you know, say one thing today and say the other things tomorrow. So India could also be sucked into it uh, as an ally, uh, which, I mean, which is rapidly becoming a US ally in the region? Well, I think we have done well so far. Uh, have in terms, we? Have we really? Yeah, I think so. Because I am firmly of the view that it is, on, it is in India's interest to swing on the side of the United States in the current moment. If there is a, a conflict between the United States and the rest, it's in our interest to be on the side of the United States. Uh, almost everybody in this audience has a member of the family living in the United States or has business interest in the living of the United States. This city is prosperous because of our connections with the United States. Let's not kid ourselves in other ways. So that there is a strong story for us to be on the side of the United States. Practically, yes, but, but emotionally? But, no, just to let me come in. It doesn't mean, and I think the gentlemen here are veterans of this, it doesn't mean that we follow the United States in every single caper that the United States uh, is involved in. I think there is a case for us to be more, I mean, this, I'm probably a, a minority in this, but in the Ukraine conflict, I think there's a, there is an interest we have on swinging with the United States on Ukraine. But on Israel, I don't think so. And I think India has done well. Uh, on, on supporting Israel? On, on supporting both. I think the, the Prime Minister has made a con comment about terrorism. And the Minister of External Affairs a few days later talked about uh, uh, the Palestinian cause and also supported the two-state solution. I think we're okay. Mr. Ahmed, do you agree with that? I said, do you agree with this, with this double? <laughs> the United States is at the lowest level today in terms of credibility as a role player in world affairs and in regional affairs. No country in the global south supports the United States either on Ukraine or with regard to Palestine. Let us be very objective here. India is not a role player in this scenario. Its concerns primarily are domestic, rearranging the idea of India on the basis of a certain ideological content and framework. It is not relevant to any major international issue that besets us today. Most of the countries of West Asia are now espousing strategic autonomy, building up very substantial ties with other countries that are major players in world affairs, China and Russia. May I also mention to you, China is likely to emerge as the most significant player in regional and world affairs. It is not uh, based on rhetoric. Chinese rhetoric indeed is extremely low key. It says very little and does a lot. It is the one country that was able to bring Saudi Arabia and Iran together. I would say to you, watch the scenario. The Chinese do not compete with the United States on the basis of military prowess. That is not their space. The United States constantly uses military force even when they should be using diplomacy. I always ask this question, has, when was the last time you heard the word American diplomacy? The only thing you ever hear is American military power, American aircraft carrier, American soldier, and see what they have done. Devastated Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya, killed hundreds of thousands of people, never achieved a single strategic end of their own. They are a failure, and they are not credible whatsoever. The world has changed, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are looking at an emerging world order which is going to be quite different. I wish we were more active role players, but we seem to have abdicated all interest in foreign affairs and are looking at reordering our own uh, domestic scenario.